Hello and welcome to the Monday, May 8, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Tenable released a blog post with details regarding Intel's AMT vulnerability that caused a lot of press and a lot of concerns last week. And well, what Tenable did discover actually is pretty severe. Turns out that AMT uses digest authentication to authenticate clients. Now, digest authentication has problems, but in itself, it's a reason solid but Intel implemented the algorithm badly when a user submits a password hash then Intel does only compare as many digits of the hash as the user submitted so if the user submits a null size hash or no hash at all then nothing is compared and the user is automatically logged in so all the user has to do is submit a username without a password and the user is automatically logged in. So a regular browser will not really allow you to exploit this, but it would be trivial to set up a little proxy that deletes the hash or to set up a custom little Python script that will lock you in and then execute whatever command you need to execute within the AMT user interface. Another important point that's made here in Tenable's blog is the test system they use, the standard Dell computer. It did come with AMT but it had to be enabled first and that's quite typical you first have to enable the feature to be vulnerable it's typically not a vulnerable out of the box but again this may depend on the vendor and on the specific system that you are looking at so given that there is now a working exploit out there, definitely get patching and it will take you some while to really find all the system and patch them all, in particular if it requires BIOS updates, disable the feature if you can, and at the very least disable incoming traffic on your firewall. And researchers at the Technical University of Braunschweig in Germany uh, did some interesting work looking at actual implementations of ultrasonic side channels. Now, what this refers to is the fact that apparently ads sometimes play an ultrasonic uh, beep at the end of the ad that identifies which ad the user just watched and well by the fact that the user actually receives that ultrasonic part they finished watching the ad then a microphone enabled application on the phone is recording the signal and reporting back that the user did view the ad now uh, these ultrasonic signals are of course useful for other privacy defeating mechanisms for example location tracking apparently stores do install beacons like this and then the app in the phone will pick up that the user just entered the store now beacons like this have been discussed in several forms over the last few years what's really new about this paper is that they actually went out and tried to figure out whether these beacons are used and indeed they found them in several European European stores. They also found them in 234 Android applications that are constantly listening for ultrasonic beacons in the background. They looked for it in TV signals but couldn't find it there. That's another possible application of these beacons where a TV ad plays the ultrasonic beacon in order for the phone to recognize and report back that the user just viewed a particular ad. Now, there isn't really a lot that you as a user can do about this other than not installing any applications that are using the microphone in the background. Now, you typically have to give applications the permission to access the microphone, but they may also have a legitimate reason to request that access and you don't really have any control over how that access is used. A more radical idea, of course, is to just disconnect the microphones in your phone. That's not quite easy because there are typically multiple microphones in modern phones and you have to actually physically snip the wire here, meaning void your warranty, and you would then only be able to use your phone by plugging in 
and headset. And then we got a good reminder by Xavier about web applications. Uh, one of uh, the items that's often not validated correctly is header data that's being sent back to the application. Actually, the one header that I see often not being validated correctly is the host header, which uh, sometimes people confuse with the server name. The host header being sent by the user doesn't necessarily have to match the server server name, depending on how you configured virtual hosting exactly on your system. So there are certainly exploit possibilities there. Refer header, most web developers who have some idea of application security will validate that header correctly or at least ignore it, which is probably the safer thing to do here. So as a pen tester, don't forget to play with these headers. And of course, as a developer, as a defender, don't forget to validate any data you receive via these headers. Well, uh, that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.